but let's go ahead and talk about HVAC prints. And this goes along very closely with Chapter 14 in your um, construction print, print reading book. Uh, okay, again, it's chapter 14 in the print book. Um, even though I do not have any assignments directly out of this book in the course, the chapter is only like four or five pages long. Please take the time to read it. It's sort of important since we're in HVAC. Um, okay, talking about design, we want to be able to clearly identify the purpose of HVAC systems. Again, most often it's comfort cooling, we call it. We want to keep people comfortable. But we also have to think about process cooling. We have to think about um, refrigeration because, believe it or not, designing large coolers, walk-in systems, and everything else like that is part of HVAC design. Um, we have to identify the, we have to be able to identify HVAC symbols on blueprints. That's really why we're going through this, this lesson. So the HVAC system is designed to provide the movement of air within a building. Okay, It's basically moving air. We're either heating that air, we're ventilating, or we're air conditioning. Air treatment involves controlling air temperature, humidity, and air cleanliness. Okay, that's what we're really worried about. Air temperature, humidity, and air cleanliness. And that's why I did all the leading up to this. We did all the humidity conversation. We talked about filters. We talked about comfort temperatures. That's why we did that first before we got into the design. Makes it easier to understand the whole picture. HVAC plans. They're either prepared by an HVAC subcontractor for residential structures and light commercial buildings, or for larger commercial structures, they're prepared by a mechanical engineer. Some states, believe it or not, do not allow you to have a mechanical engineer prepare your plans, okay? Um, it has to be done by an HVAC subcontractor. It all depends on the state. And some don't allow the HVAC subcontractor to do it, even in residential. It has to be done by the mechanical engineer. Always check building code on who's required to prepare the plans. The plans are usually just drawn on the floor plan. Okay, we really don't care about height when we're talking about our basically, we're not doing a 3D drawing when we're writing our plans. Okay, we're worried about a 2D. So when I started talking to you folks about yesterday about our final project, okay, and I gave you some examples of where we're going with it, we're worried about a two-dimensional look. If I took the roof off, if I took the first floor of, off of a house, that's the look I want to see on the plans, okay, because we're going to draw our ductwork and everything basically right on the floor plan. So when we look at a diagram, this is a commercial building, okay? And I know it's sort of small on your screens, and I'm sorry about that. But again, we have our ceiling tile grids and everything like that. We draw our ductwork and all our branch lines right onto the um, right onto the floor plan, okay? We don't say, okay, well we have another view looking up at the ceiling. We keep everything just the top-down view. We put in our ductwork, we draw it normally to scale, we put in the locations of all our registers, and everything else that goes along with that. Okay, it's a 2D view. We use HVAC symbols that are actually pretty important. Okay, so we, what you're normally, the ones you're going to use the most and the ones that I really want you to be aware of is the supply air registers. All it is is a rectangle with an X through it. That tells me it's supply air. Return air, it's a rectangle with a single line across it. Okay, that is pretty important because those are the two you're going to use more often. Um, you don't see a lot of these used in residential construction. Most of the time we just use those. But all this is is a supply outlet. Okay, it's one of those circular things. Okay, it goes in all directions. All the arrows are telling you that it's that the grill or the register diffuser goes in all directions. Okay, same here on the supply outlet ceiling diffuser. Again, it tells you that they all go in all directions. Now, 
The other very important thing you're going to see next to all the supply diffusers, once, once you get airflow and once you do your heat load, you're going to have the dimension of that supply air diffuser, so it's like a 20 by 12 outlet, but you're also going to have the CFMs. That's how many cubic feet per minute of air has to come out of that register to maintain the proper temperature and air quality in that room. You see it here too. Okay, this supply, this linear supply diffuser, in other words, it's just coming straight down from the ceiling. Okay, it's sort of like a long strip. You see them in commercial buildings along the outside walls sometimes. It's called a linear diffuser. That diffuser is 72 inches long eight inches wide and has to allow a thousand CFMs. Now you're never going to see that quantity of CFMs in a residential construction, okay? This is a commercial building. But we're normally dealing with supply air of like 300, 200, 100 CFMs. So once we start getting, once we start getting into the sizing the, once we know the size of the building and we know how much of the building each room requires, we get down to the CFMs, how, much CF, how many CFMs of air is required for each room to be comfortable and to be cooled or heated properly. Floor registers look a little bit different on a lot of prints. Okay, a floor register, they put a lot of little lines through it. I, I don't normally do that. I normally use a supply air register and just label it floor. You see it either way. Okay, quite honestly, it's too big of a pain in the butt to draw all these lines. Okay, my drawing skills leave a lot to be desired. Hot water heating supply is a single pipe. For those of you who have boilers, it's a single pipe. Hot water heating supply, and then a dotted line is the hot water return to the boiler. Remember, supply is going away from the boiler. Return is coming from the heat back to the boiler. It's returning water to the boiler. Okay, um, for those of you who have, who have seen or live in houses that have the exposed radiators, these are the old steam radiators or the big cast iron radiators you see under windows or wherever in a house. If they're built into the wall, this is a recessed radiator. Okay, I never see these. I don't expect these to be used any place, okay? Those are basically old. We label furnaces, okay? We label exhaust fans. Basically, it's a returned, return air with a arrow pointing out with an EF, okay? Um, we're not really going to worry about louver openings in the drawings we're doing. I'm really not worried about it. When we start designing ductwork, I'm going to talk to you about the putting in of the turning vanes for short elbows. We're going to try to avoid those. We do need to label thermostats. Okay, we're on our drawings. Once we get the floor plans laid out, once we decide the systems we're going to put in, we're probably going to label maybe more than one thermostat. I'm not sure yet. It all depends on the building. Okay, for duct work, the first figure is always the width. The second figure is the depth. Okay, so when you're looking at down at the duct work, the first figure is basically how wide it is. The second figure is how deep it is. So you could even do like length times height or something like that. But my first figure is my width. My second figure is looking down at it from a side view how deep it is. Direction of flow, sometimes when it's not obvious, like in a big commercial building, they'll put an arrow inside the ductwork. Lined ductwork, so if it's insulated on the inside, they actually put your ductwork with a dotted line on the inside. That shows me it's insulated inside the ductwork. So again, these are the symbols we're going to use. I don't expect, because we're not worried about what is currently in your building, we're worried about what the ideal thing is going to be in your building. I don't expect you're probably going to use these. I don't expect you're going to use that. Eh, we may use hot water, but I'm not sure yet. All depends on what your building looks like and where we get. 
Okay, primarily you're going to be using the supply air, return air, duct works. You are going to use, might use the linear diffuser. Well, no, not the linear. You might use the supply outlet, all directions. You're going to use the CFM, and you're we're going to use the thermostat. So you're going to use very few symbols of what is available to be used. Any questions on that? Okay, when we're talking about heating systems, again, um, with the reading you folks have done over the course of this last term, even if, you're, even if this is your first term, we should be familiar with most of these um, terms. But again, just to go over to make sure everyone's on the same page, a forced air heating system, air is moved through ducts to diffusers or registers by a motor-driven fan. There's a blower motor in there moves the air. Nine out of ten times, those blower motors are PSC motors, permanent split capacitor. Hydronic heating systems. Water is heated in a boiler. Pump and pipe, piping systems circulate hot water to convectors, which are the radiators that you see out in the floors. They're either along the bottom of the floor or they're the big cast iron radiators. Again, most often depends on the age of the building you're in. We also now, with electric with hydronic heating, and they don't show it here, we have the radiant heating, where you don't see any of the registers or any of the diffusers around. It actually warms the floor, sort of on the same principle as the electric radiant heating systems. It's consisted of wires embedded in ceilings, walls, and floors, and baseboards. Okay, the floor, ceiling, or wall material is warmed by the wires that are in there, or sometimes the hot water piping and it gives off radiant heat. Radiant heating systems are extremely efficient when you come to having it as hot water radiant. Okay, they're extremely efficient, they're extremely comfortable, but the electric radiant heating systems, that was back when power was really inexpensive. Back in the 70s and 80s, power did not cost as, as, much, as much as it does today. And electric radiant heating systems were being installed all over the place because you didn't have to have a boiler. You didn't have to have a furnace. You didn't have to have gas on the property. Okay, so if you ever walk into a house that has, a, that has electric radiant heating, you can always tell that by looking at the breaker panel. It's going to have a whole bunch of double pole breakers in it. That's okay, you got to, Yeah, you've got to find out where the, where the stuff is installed. Because um, if you decide to add air conditioning, you can't cut through the ceiling and hit a radiant heating cable by accident. So it's sometimes a real trick to find those cables. Okay, I use a metal detector, quite honestly, to find them. So, um, or I take a therm, or I use infrared. I turn it on and I can use infrared and I can find those hot cables. Uh, because it's sometimes a real trick to find. So that's the, different, that's the different types of heating systems. When we're looking at hydronic systems, okay, when we're laying out hydronic systems, okay, you see the piping along the outside. Here's an example of the piping. We use arrows to tell the direction of water flow. Okay, so we find our, we have our boiler someplace, and I suspect this one's downstairs someplace, but we use our, we find our water flow directions, okay? And this is a perimeter loop, it's called. And all of these radiators are on one loop. Now, there's a couple problems with this type of system. Okay, the biggest problem is wherever the radiator is that's on the end of the loop, that's going to be my coldest point in the house. That's why we don't use series systems this often designed in this way anymore. We might put every one of these in parallel or something like that. But this is the example of a hydronic system. Okay. And again, you can look here, you see the radiator and then the piping connecting all the radiators with direction of flow. Okay, so the water is going to flow out of here because the boiler's in the center there. Okay, and it's going to come around here. and it's going to come back to the boiler. 
Okay, now it's actually interesting that they came out of here into the dining room, skipped over to the entryway, came back to the dining room, and then you've gone through the entryway, which is probably my coldest point in the house. Okay, and then you come over um, to the family room, back to living room. Well, my living room, with the big slide, there's a lot of windows in the back of that living room. This is going to be a cold spot in the house, so I really hope that boiler gives off a lot of heat. Then you come out of here, again, we come over this way with the water flow. We come through our um, guest bath or our hallway bath there. Then we come into the master bath. The piping jogs around, puts a radiator on that outside wall, comes back through the master bedroom, comes through the bedroom one, and then comes back to the boiler. Okay, well, whoever's in this bedroom is going to be relatively cold because I'm dropping all this heat straight through here, okay, into the bedroom. So it's something important to sort of keep in mind how piping is set up. And this is part of what we're going to talk about with design, is we need to understand how our heat flows. And we need to realize that my furthest corner of the house may be my coldest corner of the house, okay? It's further out. It's exposed on all the walls. So maybe it's better to take my heat and start over in the furthest corner of the house and then work backwards. So we need to understand how heat flows. We're going to start talking about that on Monday. Cooling systems, okay? Because we have to design for cooling as well. Most people don't just have heating anymore in newer construction. Okay, a lot of times what you're going to be sent out to do as an installation tech or as a service tech is you're going to have to look at a house that currently only has heating and decide how we can install cooling. Because more and more people want air conditioning. Okay, and expect it. So we have unit cooling systems. Okay, they can be installed in a window or wall to cool a room or to help cool a room. Okay, we use remote cooling systems. The condensing unit is away from the area to be cooled, and air is forced past cooling coils into duct system. We call these split systems. This is nine out of time, ten times what we see, split systems. Now, one of you I saw has ductless splits in your house. Okay, it's sort of an interesting thing because ductless splits are a combination of a unit cooling system and a remote cooling system. The condenser's outside, but we don't have any duct work. You have your indoor units that are sitting right in the room. So ductless splits are a combination of the two. Um, evaporative cooling systems, I don't think anybody on this call has evaporative cooling systems because you don't live in Arizona. Arizona, New Mexico, places that are really, really dry we can throw, we can basically blow the air through a sponge and just because water evaporates and leaves the remaining area cool, we can, we can just, we don't have to use a compressor. We don't have to use um, the, the refrigerant. We can just blow air across a damp sponge and it gets cool. It's name for that is swamp cooler, basically, because those things are nasty by the end of the summer. So, those are, ba are three basic types of cooling systems. Now, again, the evaporative cooling system, I don't want to spend a ton of time on it, because, but I do need you to know what it airs. As I said, air moves rapidly across a pad of moist, fibrous material. The air is cooled as it passes through the pad. It carries room by room through a duct system, and it raises the humidity in the space being cooled as well. You cannot use this system in high humidity climates, okay? So anything on the East Coast, you really can't use it. Anything on the West Coast, you really can't use it. But when you start getting in the Southwest, sort of, again, the Arizona, New Mexico, um, some parts of Oklahoma, not as popular there, possibly some parts of West Texas, you can use this type of cooling system. Very bad. Don't even try it in other areas. It doesn't work. Air filtration. We've already spent some time talking about filters. Okay, air filtration used to clean the air passing through the HVAC system. 
sometimes an adhesive coating collects dust particles, can be disposable or washable. Folks, if you have washable air filters in anything other than a ductless split system, don't use it, okay? You want to use disposable filters as much as possible. Washable filters doesn't catch as much and doesn't contain as much of the particulates in the airstream. Now, washable filters, they're used very heavily in ductless split systems. Okay, those are the ones. I was just going to say that. Yeah, and in window units. So, now, I have seen customers who've had people build a filter rack, basically two strips of sheet metal, sort of like with a, um, with a track in it, something like this, that they, mount on, that they mount on each side of where the washable filter is in a, um, in a ductless split, in that area where the filter is. And they've actually stuffed a, a one-inch wide filter in there that's, that's sized for that. But again, I've only seen that in a commercial environment. I did some work once for, uh, it was a group pet grooming place, and they actually put um, true filters on into that um, ductless split. And the reason was because the pet fur was just miserable with those washable filters. So it was just easier to throw them out. Um, washable filters, again, over time, they'll need to be replaced eventually because they stretch and the holes get bigger and bigger and bigger and sooner or later you're going to have um, dust and particles starting to build up onto that evaporator coil. So, okay, so air filters, very important. Now, the one thing I want to just make a note of is air filters have two purposes. First of all, is the health of the equipment, okay? So if you can hold an air filter up to light, and if you can see through that air filter, okay? In other words, if you can basically see something behind the air filter, it's there for the health of the equipment, okay? It's not going to do much filtering particulates, dust, and everything out of the air. It's not designed for that. Now, if you get a filter that you can hold up to light, and all you see is light through it, okay, you, or nothing at all, okay, it's actually designed to filter particles out of the air. If you go to like Home Depot or Lowe's, you can actually find, I call the, they're the pleated paper filters, not even the big 3M heavy filters. They're more of a pleated paper material. Those are designed to start filtering dust particles out. The old, um, if you hold it, if you see a filter that's usually brown paper on the out, brown cardboard around the outside, and it has fiberglass in the center or some sort of material like that, they're basically just designed to protect the equipment. So different filters have different purposes. Okay, Cli smart climate control devices, in other words, thermostats. Programmable thermostats can if used properly, conserve energy when you're, at, when you're not at home. Smart thermostats, used to adjust settings when you're not home. Smart thermostats, things like the Nest or the IP-connected thermostats, okay? The Honeywell that, that works off the, that has the IP connections, Wi-Fi connections. Um, Z-Wave technology, smart thermostats is used to adjust settings when not home. Programmable thermostats can conserve energy when not home. However, as we start looking at our heat loads, you'll figure out why programmable thermostats are not necessarily the best thing in the entire world. Okay, you have a lot of furniture, you have a lot of dry the plaster, you have a lot of um, wood and everything like that in your house that if the temperature goes up, more than like two or three degrees, it can actually cost you more to cool that down when you get home every day than to keep it at a constant temperature all the time, okay? It can actually start costing you more. So you have to use these very carefully. Turning your thermostat up when you leave the house at 7, a in, the, 7 in the morning, okay, if you turn it up like 80 degrees in the summer, and then at night you get home around 4 p.m. in the afternoon, 
and you turn this thermostat back down to your pleasant temperature of 70 degrees, okay, that's a 10 degree temperature drop. Most systems are designed to drop 2 degrees per hour. Now that's not air temperature, that's building temperature. That's anything within the building envelope, and we'll talk more about the building envelope next week. But that's sometimes you can actually use, if you turn those thermostats up or down too much, you can use more energy than if you just left it at a, a steady temperature or maybe just adjusted it at 2 degrees. In my house, I go, I have found out that if, you had, that if the thermostat adjusts up 2 degrees during the daytime hours and we drop it 2 degrees at night, okay, that's my best energy efficiency because anything more or less than that you're, you're not really saving energy. You might think you are, but if you do true studies on it, it doesn't, do, a lot of them don't pay. Nest thermostats, I have one. I like them, um, but again, it's more, I don't know, I sort of like the toys. Do you need it? No. Do some customers want it? Yes. And it, in order to install those for a customer, you have to have a little bit of an understanding of networking. You have to understand Wi-Fi. You have to understand how to get things on a network. The directions of them are pretty good. Follow the directions. Okay, so um, that, believe it or not, that's basically the HVAC prints. I want to take a look at a couple prints right now. I'm going to pull up some of the big prints um, real quick on that. Um, I want to take a look at, we're going to take a look at the same, um, oh, I'm going to take a look at a residential print. And it's going to be the same MAR that we've been looking at. So just bear with me a sec while I pull that up. Give me one sec so I can pull the correct file up for you guys. Three, five, and seven is the one we want to look at. Okay, we're back to our residential. Okay, I'm not, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on the commercial on this because, as I said, commercial plans are sort of sometimes really weird. So, again, we're looking at the residential. Okay, this is that house, the same house that we were looking at 15 with 15-1. Okay, so if we take a look in here, this is the basement plan. Okay, the basement page you'll be able to identify pretty clearly where the furnace is. Okay, so I mean, the basement, we have a furnace. We have a water heater. Okay, there's a floor drain here. I'm required to have a floor drain in a basement next to the water heater. Now, when I'm looking at ductwork, okay, out of that furnace, this isn't labeled here, but there has to be ductwork in here eventually. Okay, we have to realize I have two support pillars here. That's what these things are. They're support pillars. Okay, so there's probably a beam going straight across the house there. Okay, so that's something we have to be aware of when we're doing ductwork because you can't cut steel beams. Outside here, I have an AC unit. So this furnace has an air conditioning coil on top of it. Okay, in some place, between here and here, okay, there's what we call the line set. Those are the suction line and the liquid line that has to connect. Normally, we tuck them along a wall someplace. Okay, so that's important. Now, the other thing I want you to see on this plan is I have some ductwork around the outside here. Okay, so this furnace has some ductwork in it. 
Okay, it's marked right there with direction of flow, with direction of where the air flows. This is a 10 by 4, this is a 10 by 4, and a 10 by 4. Okay, then you have an unexcavated place over here on the side, sort of probably concrete pad for the garage. I haven't looked at the first floor yet, but it's a concrete pad for the garage. Over here, this is again probably a concrete pad for a back porch or something like that. But this all comes into play with um, our air conditioning when we start looking at. So again, basements are important. So that's part, that's step one of the mechanical plans. We start from the bottom, we work our way up. Okay, first floor plan. Let me pull this up a little bit bigger so we can see it. Okay, yeah, over here was a garage, then we had that terrace patio, big, I mean, just depends on how they want to name it. Okay, over here, I have a vent. Okay, now this is not necessarily our air conditioning vent. Okay, it's an inch and a half. That tells me it's a plumbing vent. So sometimes you have to look and say, okay, where, what am I talking about on here? Because a vent is not necessarily an air conditioning vent. Now right here, okay, up here is an air conditioning vent. Okay, it's a 4 by 10 FV, so it basically says floor vent. Over here is the same supply that I pointed to downstairs. It's telling me that there's a basement supply. So by looking at this, it's telling me that that basement is heated and cooled. Okay, so that's probably set up to be a finished basement, even though it isn't. Now, over here, when we start looking at the duct work, and I'll change colors, tells me I have a six inch duct. And because there's only one dimension, that's a six inch round going to that floor vent. Okay, so in the basement, I have my big supply duct. And then I have a six inch round going to that floor vent. In the basement, I have a supply duct. Okay, and then I have my six inch rounds coming off there. Guest room, I have a seven inch, I have a seven inch round, but I have a four by 12 floor vent. So what this is telling me is that everything in the, all my first floor is ducted from the basement. It's all floor vents, which is av which you see a lot especially when you have basement availability and you have a first and second floor. Okay, we normally duct when we can all of our first floor from the basement. It's much easier to install. We just run it across the basement. Okay, so we have, a, so we have supply ducts all the way there. Now, we also have return ducts. Okay, so if I come across here and if I look at these plans closely, Okay, I can find my return ducts. Okay, there's one right there. And it tells me it's a 10 by 8 return. Okay, now there better be more than one in here someplace. Okay. I don't see one. Yeah, I'm trying. They might have it on the, it might be on the second floor plan. Um, again, putting a, oh, it might be a wall. It's a wall return. So this is one of these situations. We have a house that has a single return, okay? How well do you think some of these rooms are going to cool or heat with a single return? Okay, not all that well. No, that return is right there. It's not in the middle of the house. It's more in the, like, like Oh, yeah, well, you know what, it's probably, yeah, I have to look, but it might not be labeled, but there might be another one right here. The reason why I'm saying that is if you look closely at the plan, and again, I know you guys are looking at this with a small screen, 
But if you look closely at the plan, there's an 18 by 9 duct right above my um, right above where I'm right above where I just drew the green line, and then it goes into a 22 by 8. That is very possibly a return duct. The 20 by 8 is my supply. That's where all my supply registers are coming off of. But I will almost bet money that the duct that's right above my green line there is a return duct. And there's actually some registers, like there's some return grills that are connecting into that duct. So there's more than one return. Okay, that's so I'm I'm pretty sure that's a return duct based on what I'm seeing. You see the let me blow this up a little bit more. This is the other thing I wanted to show you. This right here, you see I have a dotted line, sort of um two dotted lines coming down to that return duct, and then it comes up to my main duct right there. The two dotted lines is actually a panned ceiling bay. Okay, so you ba what they do is they basically take two basement joists and they put sheet metal lining in it and then throw sheet metal up over the bottom of it and they use those as return ducts. It's not legal anymore, but you see it in a lot of older construction. Okay, where they just panned a floor joist and they use that as a return duct. It's not the best idea because there's a lot of dirt and dust that can build up in it. It gets pretty nasty. So that's what they're doing, is they've used pan bays, and there's returns in a lot of different places. Okay, so again, this, this isn't as bad of a situation as it initially appeared when you just see one return. But sometimes when you look at residential prints or commercial prints, you've got to look hard to find out where they're putting stuff. Okay, it's sometimes not very obvious how they're doing it. Okay, we look at the second floor. Oh, by the way, do you see any return, before we go to the second floor, do you see any return in that area? No. No, because again, where don't we put return ducts? The kitchen and the bath. Okay, there's a four-inch supply in here. But there's also something else missing from that bathroom that's actually interesting that it's not on this plan. What's missing from that bathroom? Ceiling vent? Yeah, there's no exhaust fan in there on this plan. Exhaust fan. Oh, okay. So if we went back to the electrical plans, which I'm not going to do right now, if there's an exhaust fan there on the electrical plans, one of the questions I would be asking is, where does that exhaust vent to? Okay, because you have to have a vent pipe coming out of an exhaust. The vent pipe is the responsibility of the mechanical contractor, which is the air conditioning guys. So if I, if on my electrical plan, if I have an exhaust fan right there, which there should be, okay, where does it vent to? Who's connecting the ductwork? What size do I need? That would be a question I would be asking. Now, we can look over here. Let me pull this up. This is my third mechanical plan. Okay. We have a drainage system, which is always broken out. That's more of the plumbing plan. Okay, I'm not really that worried about this area here. Just basically all the piping for, for the drains on the plumbing. It's required by building code that that's broken out separately. Okay, but we have my mechanical plan for the second floor. Okay, I have two bedrooms on the second floor, and then I have some breaks, okay, these little, these little um, lines right here are basically saying this is not to scale. There's part of the building missing here. Okay, so they've shrunk it down because there's nothing over that right side of the house. The left side of the house has my bedrooms, it has an upstairs, but there's nothing over the right side of the house maybe attic. Okay, so for bedroom number two, I have a 10 by 4 ceiling vent. So what they've done is they've brought everything up from the basement. They've run a master vent line up to the ceiling, which is probably coming up right here. 
you see that if, let me pull this up in size a little bit. Okay, if I pull this up in size a little bit, if you look in the center of what I just put the purple around, okay, and where I'm pointing the arrow, you see a X there. And then everything else is coming out of this 10 by 8 plenum. Okay, so this X is my riser that's coming up from the basement. So what they've done is they put a 10 by 8 riser into a wall cavity coming up from the basement. And then they're extending it in the attic. Okay, and they're running all of my duct work off of that. Now the other interesting thing is, right here, I have another 10 by 8 duct that you see here. Okay, and I'll, sur I'll throw an X around that, or I'll throw a box around that. I have another 10 by 8 duct here, okay, that is, has returns. Okay, so if you see here, it's not labeled a ceiling, diffu ceiling vent. It's a return grill. I have a 14 by 6, 14 by 6. Okay, it's all connecting into, well, yeah, there's, there's some questions on this print. Now, over here, someone screwed up on this print. Everybody see it? You see, you anybody want to guess? Yeah, it? you got a return in there. I heard two people talking. Well, I heard something about a return. Four. Yeah, the 14 don't connect to the 10. Yeah, it's actually interesting what they did. You see everything, that, everything that's labeled a CV, the ceiling vents, like there, that's in the bathroom, is connected to this upper 10 by 8 duct, which is labeled a return. Someone has background noise big time, but um, this is labeled a return over here. When reality is, that should be labeled a supply, and that's the return. I never put a return in a bathroom. Does everybody see what the problem is, why I'm saying this? This down here is my return. This riser up here is my supply. Again, I cannot put a return in a bathroom. So it's actually really interesting because this is a set of prints that's published by our textbook author. Okay, and it was done by an, it was done by an architect. And they, they have a pretty big mistake in here. They've actually labeled a return duct as a supply and a supply duct as a return. Sort of a problem. Does everybody see what I saw there? Yeah, they want the odor of the bathroom go around the house. Yeah, which I'm not sure you'd want, but I mean, I know I wouldn't want that. So again, the, they swapped the supply and the return on these prints. So does this happen in the field? Oh, yeah. Okay. You sometimes come across a set of prints with this exact issue where all of a sudden you're going through it and you're coming up with your equipment list and you're coming up with your supplies and where things are and all of a sudden you're like, wait a sec, someone messed up. So then you have to go back down to the basement and we don't in our, in our basement plan, they didn't put any duct work in. But you got to go back down to wherever they're running the risers down the wall Okay, which is actually interesting. Okay, because on the first floor, let me pull this up a little bit. This is the wall that that was running up to the attic with right there. Okay, this is just going through the wall. This is, well, I have a 10 by 8 going up, and I have a, that's up, and not LP. I have a 10 by 8 supply. So if I go back to my third floor prints, okay, they're saying the top one here, here it's labeled as a return, which it isn't by the symbol, but on the first floor, it's actually labeled properly. 
This is the type of stuff when you're in the field will absolutely drive you nuts. Because believe it or not, it's labeled properly as it comes through the wall, but it's not labeled, it's not labeled properly on the third floor. This is the stuff that you guys got to watch out for, and that's why I really, that's why we spend time on print reading. Anybody have any questions about anything that I'm looking at here and anything that I'm going through? Now's the time. Is my garage heated or cooled? Anybody, is my garage heated or cooled? It don't look like it, no. Doesn't look like it from this plan. What about from the basement? Do I see any registers in my garage? No. Garages, I mean, there's no place to run ducts under the floor. There's no sign of any ceiling vents in here, so my garage is um, not heated or cooled. Now, here's the question. Is it possible if you came up to this house and had a homeowner say, I'd like to heat or cool, heat and cool my garage because I do a lot of work on my cars. Is it would possible you, to heat or cool this? Wouldn't you have to insulate the walls? Yeah, that that yeah, that's you'd have you'd have to do some insulation. This wall right here. Let me get to a, so where I can draw a box and put a different color on here. Um, this wall right here is already insulated. This wall right there is insulated. Okay, but you're right. I would have to take a look at my outside walls. Okay, which is this the one in uh, the one in green right there, and I'd have to take a look at that wall as well. Okay, so I'd have to take a look at the two green walls. But ha but would it be possible to heat and cool this garage? Obviously, yes. How would you run the ductwork? If you looked at this plan, if you looked at this plan, and if you looked at this plan. So I guess you had to run it throughout the ceiling, right? To the top of the ceiling? Yeah, I'd have to, because over the garage, okay, my garage is over here someplace, okay? This is my roof line for my garage. So I'd have to figure out a way to get from the attic, and let me, I want to pull this down in size a little bit so you guys can see it. I'd have to figure out a way to get from the attic over this section of the house to the attic over the garage with a main supply line. Now, here's the, here's the other thing. How large is that garage? Okay, we're dealing with a quarter inch equals a foot, okay, of space. So if I had a slab over here, okay, I have my garage. That's a pretty big garage, isn't it? So if I was looking at this garage and if I had a perfectly sized system over in the main part of the house and my customer said, I want to heat and cool my garage, and if I had to figure out a way to get that ductwork through the attic to that garage, what might my options be for that homeowner? Would you simple put another unit outside the garage? What type of unit? What would you out of the out of the units we talked about? What would you think about? Would you put another big split system in there with ductwork? No, just something that's directly into the garage, right? Yeah, I'd probably use one of the ductless splits because no matter what I do, I'm never going to be able to keep that garage comfortable. That is, if you look at that second floor, okay. My supply and return registers are right here. This is a vaulted ceiling from the first floor, okay? These are those high ceilings if you look at the first floor. Let me pull this out a little bit. Okay, the dining room, great room. 
Anytime you see great room, you have vaulted ceilings. So my entire area here is an open floor plan. I don't have any walls in here. Okay, so when you look at this print, I don't have any walls here. So this entire area is an open floor plan. How am I going to get ductwork across that open floor plan from here to there? It's not doable. So what I'm going to have to do is install an outside register. Does that, or an, a split system, ductless split in there. Does that make sense? Yeah. So when you're looking at, the reason I'm going over this is when you're looking at the drawings you're going to do as we start working on the projects. Okay, when you start looking at the drawings you're going to do, okay, I'm not, I don't want you to look at your building whatever building you use, house, apartment, whatever. I don't want you to look at it how it's currently done. I want you to look at how you would like it to be done. Okay? Your wish list. Okay? If you have an unfinished, if you have an unheated garage and you like doing work in the garage, uncooled garage, cool. Let's get cooling in there, but let's be realistic on how we can get cooling in there. So when you're looking at your spaces, I want you to start looking at Okay, what is the wish list? If I had everything in the world I wanted within these four walls, what would I like the areas to be able to do? What would I like for comfort? What would I like for air conditioning? What would I like in terms of appearance? Because what we're going to do is we're going to be doing a heat load of the house. Okay. Now, I have one more thing that I want to go over before we, before we call it a day because it is Friday and I, do, and I have not really assigned anything new today um, because I really want you to have a chance of we need everybody to get caught up with what, they're do, with what I already have assigned. Um, I want to just show you an example of what I look at when I look at a house. Okay, so when I'm walking around a house and I start looking at the design of a house, okay, I do a first look at the building. Okay, so whenever a customer says to me or somebody says to me, I want to install a new heating system, I want to install a new cooling system, first of all, I never trust what's currently there. Okay, trusting what's currently installed will get you in trouble. Because over time, energy codes have changed. And who knows if the person who installed it originally did it correctly. They may not have. So the first thing we do is we walk around a building. Okay, and we take a look around the building. Okay, sorry about the blurry picture, but looking at this house, okay, what do you see? Is it a single-story house? Is it a two-story house? We want to see what the direction of the sun is because just by looking at this building, I can tell what north and south is. Okay, this is the front of a house. Okay, I see solar panels on the roof. Solar panels are always facing south. Okay, so again, when you're looking at a house, especially at this time of year, okay, you can a lot of times see different signs about what is facing north and south. So it's very important to know which direction the house is facing. Everything you're doing for design, we want to know the direction the house is facing. Okay, now, you can barely see it through the tree line, but there's dormer windows up here. Now, you would be tempted to say this house has a second floor. It doesn't. Those are fake. Okay, and the reason you can tell they're fake is they're actually installed above a porch. Okay, this is a porch area with a roof overhang. You can see the three supports right there. The dormer window is a fake. It's for appearance only. So I don't have to worry about a second floor. So everything along the top of the house is attic. Okay, so this is a single-story house. As you look around the house, you won't see any basement windows. And I'll show you the other side of this in a second. You won't see any basement windows. Okay? So we wanted, this is part of why we walk around a house at first. It will tell you a lot about the house. I have a garage, there's a garage over here. Okay? Now, 
You look at the other side of the house, this happens to be the east side, okay? There's no windows. This is going to be an easy heat load to do. There's no windows on this side of the house. And again, if you look along the foundation line, there's no basement windows, okay? So it tells me the house is on a slab because at least between the front and the side, if you have a basement, you're going to have a basement window there someplace. There's no exhaust up here. Okay, there's no vents, so it tells me there's a ridge vent, okay, which is the attic vents from the top. We go to the back. Again, direction of the sun tells me a lot. This is late in the afternoon. Look at the shadows. That tells me the, this over here is west, so I'm looking at the north side of the house. East is over there. East is here. I'm looking at the north side of the house. You can always tell from the shading what direction it is. I don't even have to take a compass out on the job site. Okay. Again, odd-shaped house a little bit because there's some areas that come out further. This is in more. There's a porch here. This comes out a little bit further. And this is the same side of the house as my garage is. So I have a garage in the front and some room or rooms to the back. Then again, looking at the west side of the house, okay, this is where all the equipment is. I have to be very aware of my service panels. In this case, there's extra service panels because of solar. Okay, air conditioning condenser. Have to be aware of, in this case, have to be aware there, there's something going on in the ground. That happens to be a line going to a well pump. Okay. Now, there's a window in the garage. Now, the garage happens to be not heated or non-cooled, so I, do I care about the window in my heat loads? No, but I still have to show it. There's a little window here, okay? I'm looking at material. I'm looking at what type of roof do I have. This is a white, a whitish asphalt shingle, okay? Looking at other construction of the house. That's why I do initial walk around the house. So when you're doing your plans, okay, it's sometimes very great because when I walk away from this property, I won't have the information anymore. I'm going to be thinking to myself, okay, well, there was an air conditioning condenser installed. Where was it? Yeah, I know there was a window on the west side of the house. Um, where is it? Where is it placed? Okay, if I forget to do something on my drawings. So I always, I always take four pictures around the house, around the outside of the house, and I take them pretty wide angle. Okay, I want all side of the house so I can actually see what's on the house. Okay, yeah, there's some caution tape up here, but that's because there's a bee problem going on that they're trying to keep dogs away from. So, okay. So that's what we're looking at when we start working on our design portion. But the first step in the design portion is what I was talking about when we do, um, I put it in today's module. And this is not due yet, okay? So I just put it out there a little bit early. The first step is to draw a floor plan of a house, apartment, or another building you want to use, okay? I mean, again, I definitely don't want to invade anyone's privacy or anything like that. Nobody sees it but me. So it doesn't have to be to scale, but please make sure you have decent measurements, okay? If for some reason you don't wish to use your own house, send me an email, not a text. Send me an email, and I'll give you some directions. Please make sure you have window placements, door placements, and all measurements of windows and doors, length times width. We're going to need to find the glass area, okay? So I'm going to need to eventually find the area of the glass. It makes a difference, okay? Estimate the height of outside walls, okay? Because again, one of the things we have to do when we figure out how much heat and cooling is either gained or lost through a house, we have to find out the area of the walls because our heating and cooling formulas actually require area measurements of the substances that heat moves through. And I'll go start going through this more next week. Okay, the drawings, again, I promise you guys not share to anybody, but I need to see the project as it's being done along the way. Step one, we've got to get a floor plan. 
Okay, and the outside walls are the most important, and you'll see why on Monday and Tuesday. So, okay, let me kill the recording here because that's all I really need to record, and then I'll, I have...